Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, as we can see from the introductions, I think one thing we all have in common is we love to study the Bible. We love the writings of Ellen White and we're all trying to live healthier lives. So that's what tonight's study is all about. We're not reading the entire book, Councils on Diet and Foods, but we're gonna try to read parts of it, highlights of it, so that we can apply it to our lives. Because sometimes there's this misconception in the Adventist church that this is an outdated book, that it's not really relevant, that it's going to scare people off. But that's actually not true at all. I think out of all the books in my life, besides the Bible, this book has made the greatest difference, not only in my physical life, but in my spiritual life as well. So I'm sure you're very familiar with it, but we're just going to take it at a leisurely pace. Um, I say leisurely, even though we're going to be condensing three chapters in about 40 minutes. But I'll send you out the links afterwards. And just in case you want to study it out more, you can read those links yourself. Um, but before we begin, Mark, would you be willing to start us in prayer? Yes. Thank you. Let's just bow our heads if possible. Father in heaven, I'm just so grateful that we can have this Bible study. Well, it's councils on diets, foods, but it's a prophet. So it's very similar to that. And we're, we're grateful, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be here with us. So we might be able to, to listen and understand. And as Jeff said, put this all into action because uh, faith without works is not so good. So we got to we got to just learn to do what you ask us to do by your power, not by might nor by <laughs> anything that we do, but by the Holy Spirit. So we thank you, Lord, that you're giving us this blessing right now with Ashley. Thank you so much. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. 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 So basically, tonight's agenda is I'm just going to go over some quick health statistics. I'll give you a quick history lesson from SDA history. And then the rest of the time, we're going to share um, tips, practical applications, some readings, some Bible cross-referencing, so that we can hopefully take away something new from tonight's study. And I know in the past, whenever I went to health studies, I wanted right away to know, what do I have to do to lose weight? What do I have to do to exercise better? What do I have to do to get better sleep? But none of that really mattered if I didn't have my spiritual life in check and in alignment with the word of God, because we can have the best intentions of the world, but if we're doing something that's contrary to the word of God, we're not going to receive any great success. So tonight is strictly going to be on the spiritual reasons to be healthy, because if we understand it spiritually, then the physical part is actually going to be really easy. It doesn't have to be this long, strenuous process that we're told it's going to be. Um, it could actually be pretty quick and pretty rapid as soon as we understand the spiritual reasons why we should do certain things. And if we look at these statistics here, you can see that in general, Americans are living about 30 more years than they did in 1900. But 79 to me is still not that old. Like, I think we should actually be living a lot longer than 79. But that's the average life expectancy as of 2013. But even though people are living longer, 61% of people older than 65 have multiple chronic conditions. So even though they might be living 30 years longer, those 30 years sometimes are very miserable because there's not just one issue, there's actually multiple issues. And God didn't design us to be like that. And that's why we're going to look at some of the spiritual reasons on how not to be like that. We live in a country that has a lot of oxymorons. It has a lot of conflicting statements. Um, out of all the countries in the world, the United States has the most gyms. Um, as of 2020, there was about 201,000 gyms. And that doesn't include hotel gyms, home gyms, school gyms, work gyms. So you would think we would be this country with physically fit, active people. But if we look at the obesity trends on the right side of the screen, <coughs> excuse me, we can see we are at the highest obesity rate that we've ever been at. So something is wrong in how we're doing things here in America. And we can also see, we can see on the left side of the screen here that social media platforms are at the highest they've ever been. Excuse me. But yeah, on the right hand of the screen, suicide rates are at the highest that they've ever been. Yeah. <clears throat> While I cough it out just for a minute, if you want to take a look at the screen here. <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> Let's see. Um, 
All right. So it looks like this chart's about drink quality by, <laughs> by industry. Um, so obviously we all know uh, drinking alcohol is really not good for us. Um, and this is kind of an interesting uh, chart here. Um, quite a lot of data. Um, Mark, do you want to help interpret it, interpret it for me? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try to do that. Hospital and healthcare, it says right there. I drink. What, we're talking about water. We're talking about alcohol. <laughs> what alcohol. are we doing here? Alcohol. alcohol. This is alcohol. Yeah. Put snow at the bottom. Yeah, alcohol. Oh, okay. Alcohol. What a mess. Yeah. So I'm going to AA, if that's what you want to know. <laughs> I was drinking a couple of beers at night, and I didn't like to do that anymore, and I had a hard time stopping it. So I'm going to AA. So here it is. Uh Moderate, uh, healthy, zero to five drinks a week. That's healthy? I don't think that's healthy. But okay, that's what they say. I don't believe Moderate. the zero percent on the automotive and manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. What were you going to say, Ashley? Give me some so, direction here. Thank you so much. Thank you for, I, I'm getting over a loss of voice. And once that tickle got in there, I just couldn't get it out. So thank you very much. Yeah, I I just thought it was ironic that like, we're supposed to be the healthiest we've ever been because we're living longer. But yeah, obesity rates are the highest. Gym memberships are at the highest. Depression, suicide is at the highest. Social media is at the highest. And drinking, it's hard to know like when drinking has been the highest because in colonial America, people would actually have beer three meals a day. It was actually cleaner than water. So a lot of children would actually start the day with beer. It's fairly normal back then. But if we look here, out of all the different industries, it looked like in automotive and manufacturing and in construction, for those people that drink, they are drinking more than 15 drinks a week. It's considered excessive drinking, 66.67 of them. And I agree with what Lisa said, like it looks unbelievable that 0% of automotive and manufacturing people are only drinking zero to five drinks a week. I mean, obviously there's gotta be something in that category. So even though these statistics <laughs> might be a little flawed in some areas, it shows that we really have a health crisis here in America. And I wish I could say it wasn't in the church, but it is in the church. And it might even be in your life because I know I've struggled with a lot of these things. So as we go throughout the study, it's not to um, tell anyone what to do. It's America, you can do whatever you want. Um, I believe in religious freedom. But this is only to present what Ellen White says and what the Bible says, things that we can do so that we're healthy and that we're not part of this great American crisis. And a lot of people wow. think Ellen White was actually the health reformer of the Adventist church. She was, but one of the men who actually showed her how to do things was actually Joseph Bates. And sometimes we don't give him enough credit. Um, he was actually born right after the Revolutionary War in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He always wanted to be a sailor. But as you know, a lot of times if you went to sea, you never came back. But finally, at 15 years old, his parents said, all right, you can be a cabin boy. So he becomes a cabin boy. He escapes shark attack. He was actually fixing something on the ship. He fell off. <clears throat> and he fell off because the men were baiting a shark. And as soon as he hit the water, the shark automatically went to the opposite side of the boat until they were able to fish him out. And then all of a sudden... As soon as he was rescued, the shark went back to its original position. And he wow. felt that this was God protecting his life. Um, there was multiple Amen. shipwrecks that he was involved in. Um, during the War of 1812, he was actually kidnapped by the British Navy. And he said, he was told, you're going to fight the French for us. He refused to do that because the French were America's allies. So he was actually put in a POW camp, which was in an old abandoned ship. And he was Oof. locked up in there for over a year. And amazingly, he survived the war. His dad actually wrote the president and somehow the president got involved and he actually got brought home to America and he was totally fine. He was malnourished, was a little traumatized, but he picked himself up and he kept on moving. He became a captain of his own ship, but he had no interest at all in religion. But his wife had actually packed a Bible in his clothes chest. He had a bunch of cheap novels because Back then, if you were out on the seas, there was nothing else to do. So even men were reading romance novels. And he had a bunch of just like not so good novels in there. His wife put in a Bible and he is so bored. He reads it. He is convicted. And this is not through any church, not through any writings, just the Bible. 
he's convicted to give up alcohol and tobacco. He's the captain of the ship. So he tells the sailors to give him up. And at first they didn't want to, but then they realized there was no fighting. There was no mutiny. Everybody got the job done. There was no drama. They actually preferred it. And the next year they volunteered <laughs> to sail with him again. It was baptized a little after that. And not only did he become a Christian, but he actually got really involved in a lot of um, temperance activities and in social reforms and in the abolition of slavery. And he was always seeking to understand the Bible. No matter how difficult it was, he was committed to understanding it better. So then he meets William Miller. He accepts his teachings that Jesus is coming soon. And he actually studies the seventh day Sabbath. And he heard about it from this little old woman. And back then, there was a couple of Baptists keeping the seventh day Sabbath, and he started keeping it. And he tried to share it with Ellen and James White. They were not interested. They didn't think it was that important. They rejected it. <clears throat> but then he wrote this book called The Seventh Day Sabbath, A Perpetual Sign. It actually convinced them to give up Sunday keeping and to start keeping Sabbath. And then this Amen. was before any health visions Ellen White ever had. He was convicted <clears throat> to give up meat dairy, grease, and sugar. And as you read her books, that's going to come up quite a bit. He started doing this years before she was doing it. He just had a water and a plant-based diet years before anyone else. And he was incredibly instrumental in proclaiming the health reform and the three angels' messages. So this book that he wrote, um, this book that he wrote is now free on Amazon. Oh, oh thank you. There's no charge for that. All right. Or at least there wasn't for me. I am a prime <laughs> member, so you know. Okay. It's an amazing book. Um, Elaine, if you don't mind sharing the link with me and I'll share it with everyone. It yeah. is so interesting, guys. You know, some books are kind of boring. You know you should read them, but they are boring. This one is so good. Like it's riveting. Basically, anything crazy that could have possibly happened to him, it did happen. And he's a very well written writer as well. So if you want to check that out more, we'll send you the link later on. And I tell this to you because a lot of times we just associate health with Ellen White, but there was a lot of other people that were convicted. There was a lot of other denominations that were actually really involved in health as well. It's not just the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And what I'm about to share on the screen sometimes could be controversial, but Adventists are not the only people with this view. There's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of YouTube channels that are convicted that our bodies are the temple of God and we need to take care of them. And if we look at the Bible, appetite has always been an issue. Adam and Eve, when they were tempted, it was through appetite. That was their first sin. Daniel and his friends, one of their first temptations was through appetite. Thankfully, they rejected it. Jesus, Amen. his first temptation was over appetite. And if you go to the seven churches in Revelation, the first promise is to eat of the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of God. And we can't eat from that tree because we have perverted appetites and we're sinful beings. But in heaven, we'll eat from it. So it's really interesting how like appetite is actually a huge issue within scripture. And Ellen White has a lot to say about this from page 44 of Councils on Diet and Food. So if someone doesn't mind reading it, um, that would be really helpful. Oh, it's on here. I'll read it. It is a duty to know how to preserve the body in the very best condition of health. And it is a sacred duty to live up to the light which God has graciously given. If we close our eyes to the light for fear, we shall see our wrongs, which we are unwilling to forsake. Our sins are not lessened, but increased. Okay. So for many years, I didn't like the book Councils on Diet and Foods because she pointed out things in my life that I was doing that I did not want to be made aware of. So I would close my eyes as to what she was saying. But according to this, my sins were increased, not decreased. So as we go throughout the study, I just want to offer two disclaimers. If anything is uncomfortable or if anything you're not sure about, just study it out yourself because I'm not an expert. Um, I don't like to tell people what to do. That's not the intention at all. I just like to share information as it comes across my way. So just keep that in mind. If anything is ever uncomfortable, check it out, fact check me, share me things. I'll share it with the group as well. And secondly, like I am not an authoritative source. You know, there are times where I can make mistakes and I'll acknowledge it. So feel free to let me know if something you feel is being misinterpreted. But as much as possible, I try to stick true to history, to Ellen White, and to the Bible, because this is something that I really want to understand better. 
Mm -hmm. And within the Adventist church, there's this huge movement to like throw out the testimonies to the church. They think it's really not that important anymore. They think too big of an issue was made over health. And I agree. I think people like my father's generation were really hit over the head with health. Um, I was <clears throat> laughing with, with my dad, asking him if he ever ate care of. And he was like, oh, yeah, but, you know, I haven't touched it since 1975. <laughs> And yeah, because it was probably forced on him at all those self-supporting schools he went to. So like I could understand why people might have a negative view of the health reform message. But Ellen White says it's actually people are doing that because they're trying to divert people's minds from present truth. They're going to extremes. So now instead of embracing it, they're saying it's not important at all and they're throwing it away. And that's what this study is supposed to do is just to kind of shed some light on that. So now that you have a little background as to the study, a little historical context, we're going to jump right into the next study for maybe about the next 25 minutes or so. Um, we're going to look at what does Ellen White, what does the Bible say about why we should be healthy? So if one or two people want to read what's on the screen, and then we have a Bible verse and some questions at the bottom. I'll read. For the glory of God. Only one lease of life is granted us, and the inquiry with everyone should be, how can I invest my powers so that they might, may yield the greatest profit? How can I do most for the glory of God and the benefit of my fellow men? For life is valuable only as it is used for the attainment of these ends. Yeah. To receive, let me stop. Yeah. Go ahead. To receive more blessings, one reason why we do not enjoy more of the blessing of the Lord is we do not heed the light which he has been pleased to give us in regard to the laws of life and health. That's from the Review and Herald, May 8, 1883. Thank you. So we can see right away, if you start being healthy, there'll be physical benefits, which we'll talk about in other studies, but the top two benefits are it glorifies God and you're going to receive more blessings. So if someone would like to read 1 Corinthians 10 31, we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the second question at the bottom. First Corinthians 10 31 says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. So how does that Amen. relate to our health? Well, everything you do, you need to eat right, and you sleep right, you do eight natural remedies. That's what it means. Everything you do, especially how you think. Yeah. And what are some blessings you guys have experienced through healthy changes? We've all made changes at some point in our life. We're probably still making changes. Um, what are some spiritual or physical blessings that you've experienced? Well, the first thing that I, I learned when I became a Seventh-day Adventist is that blood is very important. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And if I'm going to have to have good blood, I have to eat good food so I can have good thoughts. And the Holy Spirit communicates to me through my brain, which needs bl good blood. So therefore, I thought it'd be better to observe these health laws because I wanted to be healthy. I thought I was healthy. Well, I was strong, but I wasn't healthy. <laughs> Big difference. I would like to uh, speak a little bit about that. Uh, I haven't been a Seventh-day Adventist very long. I I've been a, uh, a Lutheran. I've been a uh, Catholic. I've been a Baptist. And uh, I came to the Seventh-day Adventist uh, because the uh, Baptist that I went to Bible school with, I really uh, became very, very interested in the Bible and the, and the Catholic Church didn't teach the Bible. They didn't have one at that time. Uh, anyway, uh, in our Bible study, uh, they never uh, talked much about the uh, God, uh, God's day and they uh, celebrated uh, the, the Sunday as their day of Sabbath. And I kept reading about it and reading about it and, and came to the conclusion that something's wrong here. And uh, I asked each member of uh, the Bible study class one at a time, I, I'd say, do you really know which day the Sabbath is? And to a man, every one of them told me that, yes, it's the seventh day of the week, it's Saturday. 
So I, I, you know, I was curious as to why are we celebrating it on Sunday in the Baptist church? So um, I started reading about it and, and I, I got a visitor from, from the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church in Richardson, Texas. And this guy told me the truth. So I went to a, uh, they were having a, a, uh, a session about uh, uh, revelations. And I'm very interested in revelation. I like to learn as much as I can about it. But anyway, uh, I love Seventh-day Adventist church because everything I've learned there is the truth. And their uh, uh, preface is the Bible uh, prove everything that you read on the Bible. And, and that's what I want to do. And that's what I do. Amen. Amen. That's Praise exciting. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I, I love the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm so pleased to learn what I have been learning. Uh, I've joined the, I joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church when I first came to here, and that would have been uh, 2016, but I, I was told that there was one in Naples, and I drove down there, and there was, it was locked up. And some people were there in behind in, at, in a parking lot. And they told me that they had sold this church to the Lutherans. And I said, oh, so finally I did find the, uh, the church here in, in uh, Benita Springs. And uh, I went there and, well, I called there and, and the, the pastor told me that they, they, their sessions were in Spanish. And not knowing Spanish, I... I decided to look elsewhere and, and I believe he's the one that told me about the church in Fort Myers which I uh, the next Sabbath I went there and I was totally pleased I love my church I love the people <laughs> there although I don't know many of them now I've, I've been going for uh, I was a snowbird and partially uh, when we come down I'd go to that church and and that would have been 2018 and I've, mm. I've been going there ever since uh, like I say I was a snowbird and uh, I wasn't uh, I didn't spend uh, every uh, part of my time there, uh, but I, I'm I'm there solid every Sabbath now. It's my church. Amen. And they're my Good. people. You people are my people. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. What next? Um. So I'll share. It's actually not about me. It's about a friend of mine. But um. <clears throat> You know, he um, he recently lost a lot of weight, and um, he had some other issues he was struggling with, and he uh, he got like really clarity of mind, and he um, lost a lot of weight, and he um, didn't have any issues with depression or stress or anything like that, or at least not as much as he did prior to. And everybody got really concerned. They said, "You lost so much weight. Are you okay? Are you okay?" And then his answer was, "No, I just stopped drinking alcohol." So, <laughs> so I think I think that the you know that's obviously a, an experience where he um, you know adopted some of more biblical principles and received a tremendous blessing in his life. Amen. Absolutely, amen. One of the things that I'm really thankful for is my parents. We lived on a farm and they planted gardens, and so. It was an everyday experience to go and get stuff out of the garden. Now, I prefer vegetables still over anything else, you know. So, so it's the upbringing from a very young age and <clears throat> knowing the principles of good nutrition that are so helpful. Amen. We can see that there's so many benefits, so many spiritual benefits to being healthy. First of all, it honors and glorifies God. He reminds us that our bodies are his temple where the Holy Spirit dwells, and we are to care for them just like people cared for the ancient temples. Secondly, if you want more blessings, you got to obey what God has told you to do. So the more you obey the laws of health, the more blessings that he will pour out upon you. And if we go to the next slide here, we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will send it out to you later. Um, you guys are very familiar with the lamb in the Bible. It had to be a perfect male lamb without spot, without blemish. And God would actually get really angry when people would give him like the deformed lambs or the old lambs or the maimed lambs because they were being disrespectful. They were just taking the most worthless lamb of their flock and offering it to God. 
So he required a perfect lamb. In fact, he required their best lamb, which represented Jesus. And then later on in Romans, Paul tells us that our bodies, we are to offer it as a living sacrifice, perfect and ble without blemish. Now, obviously we're sinful. So like, I know I have lots of blemishes. So it's not that like we're perfect people, but we are to do our best to offer our body as a living sacrifice to God. And Ellen White has a way with words. I think she's kind of funny when she writes this, but she's also very blunt. She says, God requires the body to be rendered a living sacrifice to him, not a dead or a dying sacrifice. The offerings of the ancient Hebrews were to be without blemish. It will it be pleasing to God to accept a human offering that is filled with disease and with corruption. So obviously we all get diseases at some point. Later on, she's going to reassure us there is hope for you, but we're not supposed to defile mm -hmm. our bodies and then expect God to be happy with it. So a third benefit of being healthy is that we can offer our bodies as a holy sacrifice to God. Um, just in case that's discouraging to any of you, you can read this quote later on. She reminds us God is all pitiful. He's gracious. He's tender. Even if you have harmed your bodies, he will help you. He will accept your inferior pitiful sacrifice and he will accept it as it is. And he will help you be a better person, but it's better. Amen. We don't get to that point at all. So this is a really, really great quote. I hope you check this out later because I know we've all abused our bodies. I'm surprised they have any brain cells left, you know, but God, if you start obeying him, he will greatly pour his blessings out upon you and he will rebuild all those years of abuse to your body. <clears throat> this is a great slide. We'll spend a little bit more time on, but if you want your prayers to be answered, what you need to do is start obeying the health message. And if you don't know what that health message is, that's okay. We have six more weeks to go. We'll unpack it for you. But if someone wants to Amen. read this and then we'll talk about the question at the bottom. I can read it. To prepare the way for the prayer of faith to be answered. The health reform is a branch of the special work of God for the benefit of his people. I saw that the reason why God did not hear the prayers of his servants for the sick among us more fully was that he could not be glorified in so doing while they were violating the laws of health. I also saw that he designed a health reform and health institute to prepare the way for the prayer of faith to be fully answered. Faith and good works should go hand in hand in relieving the afflicted among us and in fitting them to glorify God here and to be saved at the coming of Christ. Testimonies, testimonies for the church, um, 1, 5, 60, 61, 1867. Amen. So how does being healthy prepare the way for our prayers to be answered? If we want more prayers to be answered, um, what are the spiritual benefits to being healthy? Obey. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Obey. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like asking God to help you lose weight, but you're like, you're stuffing your face with junk food. Ask, you're asking him to bless you. Like, it, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Or if you're like, you know, smoking a pack and a half a day and you have lung cancer, but you're asking God to heal you of that lung cancer. God loves you and he wants to heal you, but he's not going to do it if you're violating the laws of health. And, and I, I say this totally without judgment because I have violated those laws many times, but this is a good reminder for me that um, maybe my prayers are being hindered because I might not be obeying those laws of health that he has shown me. If we look here, we know the loud cry, that is something that is going to come about right before Jesus comes, where there is going to be this passion and this urgency to the last day truth. Ellen White tells us thousands will be brought into the church at the 11th hour. Family and friends we never thought would be interested are going to, they're going to put up their banner under the Seventh-day Adventist message. And to me, this is really exciting. And the only way that this can be done is through the loud cry. Angels are going to help us. They're going to increase the intensity and people all around the world are going to be converted. And Ellen White reminds us that actually the health message is part of this. So even though this is a longer quote, I was hoping we could still read it. So maybe one or two people would like to read it. And then we'll talk about the question at the bottom. I'll start. The health reform I was shown as a part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with it as are the arm and hand with the human body. I saw that we as a people must make an advanced move in this great work. Ministers and people must act in concert. 
God's people are not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel. They have a work to do for themselves, which they should not leave for God to do for them. He has left this work for them to do. It is an individual work. One cannot do it for another. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Gluttony is the prevailing sin of this age. Lustful appetite makes us slaves of men and women and beclouds their intellect and stupefies their moral sensibilities to such a degree that the sacred elevate elevated <clears throat> truths of God's word are not appreciated. The lower propensities have ruled men and women, CD 32.2. I was shown that if God's people make no efforts on their part, but wait for the refreshing to come upon them and remove their wrongs and correct their errors, if they depend upon that to cleanse them from filthiness of the flesh and spirit and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. The refreshing or power of God comes only on those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them, namely cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Testimonies for the church, uh, 1619, 1967. 18. So the loud cry is necessary because people are not going to be converted to biblical truth if it isn't for the angels of the Holy Spirit paving the way. But in order for the loud cry to be coming upon us, in order for us to preach with that urgency and that intensity, we do have to be following the health message. So how does being healthy prepare the way for us to usher forth the loud cry? So basically, like, how does being healthy make us better missionaries? Well, we set an example by being healthy. Amen. We're not obese. We're healthy. Another thing uh, is that uh, if you, if you're, uh, most missionaries are in foreign countries, and the med medical uh, clinics and so forth that they have are sometimes kind of hard to get to, especially if you're not of that country. And I think that would uh, help. You know, when I see someone that's healthy, I tend to think of discipline, that they've been disciplined in eating, they've been disciplined in exercise, but we all know that we have to be disciplined in terms of obedience to, you know, God's commandments. Yes. And that's just mm -hmm. another example, the physical example of discipline that we need to have uh, spiritually in order to, you know, walk with God. Amen. Amen. And it makes a difference in our spiritual life as well. Like when I eat junkie, it's not that I lose my love for Jesus. I still love Jesus. I still read my Bible, but I notice the quality of my devotions are different. Like when I'm eating like really healthy, I'm not eating in between meals. I'm not eating late at mm -hmm. night. Like my devotions are very sharp, but if I'm getting a little lax with what I'm eating, um, I still have devotions, but they're, they're not as intense. Um, they're not as meaningful. And I've even tried memorizing scripture. Like I can memorize scripture fairly well if I'm on a healthy diet. But I remember last year, my birthday is in April and somebody had just spent a week at our house and left a lot of junk food. So I'm like, oh, it's, it's my birthday. Jeff's at work. Let me eat this junk food. And I remember that night I was like trying to go through what I was memorizing and I could, but it was so difficult. Like, And the only difference, the only thing that I had done differently was the quality of food that I had eaten. So to me, that really cemented it in my head that like what we eat does make a difference in our spiritual life. It's not going to make you hate Jesus. You're not going to fall out of love with Jesus, but you might not have as intense of a relationship. You might not be as passionate. It might not be as sharp. You know, if you're eating and drinking things that really aren't that good for you. It's yeah. interesting that you revealed that just role in public is state patrol, but his role in private life is also state patrol. <laughs> 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 oh, good one, Jeff. 
That's, That's funny. funny. I think I'll eat this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dare enforce the rules in the house for that. <laughs> most, most people like coming to our house because they're like oh it's so easy to lose weight here there's no junk food <laughs> like, mo most of our guests like it but we had one guest i think it must have been too much because there was a lot of junk food that was left <laughs> <laughs> and one of the oh, last wow. reasons that we experienced great spiritual benefits is because it actually separates us from the world and i'm not going to read the whole thing i'll just summarize it for time but we know Sodom and Gomorrah, they are known for like homosexual rape. But there's actually a lot of other things they're known for. I think in Isaiah or Ezekiel, it says for pride and fullness of stomach. So they were actually known for pride and for gluttony. And it really hit home to me when I was reading Eleanor's writings. She said all of these six sins, the way was paved for that by eating and drinking to excess. So it's not like they were just born like that um, because they were constantly abusing their bodies with food and with alcohol. It actually led to the point where they were doing heinous things to each other, no matter the gender, no matter the relation. And that's pretty alarming because none of us would ever envision that we would ever do anything like that. But sometimes in society, gluttony and drunkenness are totally mainstream. And it's actually made a joke of. I know that Jeff and I go to the gym a lot and, you know, everybody jokes like, oh, you have one cheat day a week, but that's basically a day of gluttony. Like th that is not good for you. That's not <laughs> normal. But in today's society, like I remember my friend and I would diet in college and like one day a week would eat whatever we wanted. But that was so bad for our systems. And that's totally <laughs> normalized. And Ellen White actually says the lifestyle of that will actually benumb your mind and your spiritual sensibilities. And you'll actually start creating and doing sins you never thought were possible. So by staying away from that, you actually stay away from certain types of sins. And Matthew 24, 37 to 39 warns us a little bit about this. So if somebody would like to read that, and then we'll talk about this question at the bottom. 24, 24, 37, oh, no. 39. All right, I got it. As it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came upon and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So we can see that gluttony, drunkenness, divorce, even not even getting married, giving a marriage is like a euphemism for just like relations outside of the marriage. That's pretty mainstream in America and across the world. So we can also see this playing out in the church, unfortunately. So does anybody have any insight from this passage, from what's going on? Um, how do the words of Matthew relate to our world today? I'd like to ask a question if I could, Ashley. Um, I, in I read uh, Ellen White's books quite uh, often, and uh, I really, I really love this lady's writing. That uh, I had read that uh, Noah was a uh, preaching to the people for years before they built the ark, and he was telling them about the flood coming, and they they refused to believe him. So they say here that they didn't know. Oh. Well, they had never experienced rain before. They didn't know what water, what a flood would be. I didn't know that. <laughs> they, they, they had water. <laughs> yeah, but they never had experienced rain. rain. Well, I don't know about that, but I do, I do okay. know that they, they learned. In traveling, I met a girl in Lima, Peru that had never seen rain. And it shocked me coming from the Northwest. I was like, how can you never have seen rain? <laughs> wow. I believe in Ellen White's writings, she wrote that um, a dew, I don't know, I can't remember if it's in the Bible or not, but I know she wrote that a dew had watered the ground. And so mm -hmm. they hadn't actually, ex they hadn't actually seen rain. It was just a dew that watered the ground. Yeah. And so mm. rain was like foreign to them. Wow. 
Yeah, that was Shakira. That's exactly it. That's Genesis 2 6. Because I was, it's funny, like Shakira is so good about taking the thoughts out of my head. It's funny how <laughs> a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times, like she says it exactly what I was thinking. So great job, Shakira. That's taken from <laughs> scripture. You know, just what she said the the dew watered the ground. And um, like what Brenda said, you know, they weren't familiar with rain until it came. And they knew a flood was coming, but they just didn't want to acknowledge that because it meant that they would have to repent. And also in her writings, it also talks about this in Jewish writings. For one week, Noah and his family were locked up in the ark. Mm -hmm. And for one week, their patience was tested. And the people around the ark tried to set the ark on fire because they were laughing at them saying, oh, you know, look at this rain. There's no rain. You guys are just making a mockery of everything. And as soon as they set it on fire, thunder and rain poured down from heaven. And within just a matter of hours, like the ark was floating on the water. So yeah. I think a lot of this is in Josephus's history of the Jews. Ellen White writes about it in Patriarchs and Prophets. And obviously Genesis talks a lot about it as well. But yeah, I think that that's a great question. I don't know if that provides clarity, but those were some of the books that yeah. stood out to me. Yeah. But that's not where all the water came from. Some of the it says that the fountains of the deep were where I had broken yes. up. Yeah. And so I think it uh a lot of the water came from the center of the earth. And um uh, the there was a I think before the flood there was lots of lot more land than water. And after the flood there was a lot more water than land. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons in Revelation twenty one it says there will be no more sea in heaven. Because all that water yeah. is probably left over from the flood. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that water will be back where it's supposed to be in terms of cooling the earth right. and, and uh, keeping the temperature very uh, moderate. So I think it uh, uh, everything was ruined as far as the atmosphere. We know that um, before the flood, they had, uh, I don't know, I think it was six times more oxygen than um, available on the earth than after the flood. That's really why the life expectancy fell off so fast. Right there too. That's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, as we come to a close here, because I don't want to hold you guys over, um, the reason why we spent the first study just on the spiritual benefits of being healthy is because you won't be able to reach your physical fitness goals if you don't have Jesus as part of your life. Because when you look at all these fitness influencers, a lot of them are really healthy, but give it five or 10 years, they're gonna fall off the wagon. It's happened to all of us. I mean, a lot of former fitness personal <clears throat> trainers, you know, and sometimes they just give up, they're done with it. And, you know, if you're on a keto or paleo diet, you know, it's not sustainable. And all of this is actually worthless unless we buy into it spiritually and unless we're doing it God's way. So I don't profess to have all the answers, but I do like studying the Bible and I do like the writings of Ellen White. And in future weeks, we're actually going to study about what are things we should be eating? What should we be drinking? How should we be exercising? What exercises are best? Um, what are some things we can do to maximize optimal health? And I'll set this out to you because there were some slides we skipped over just for the sake of time. But if you want to unpack this a little bit more, I encourage you to read chapters one through three of Ellen White's Councils on Diet and Foods. I'll send you out the link after this. It wasn't until I bought into it spiritually that I actually had success. Prior to that, I'd always fall off the wagon. I'd be good for a week and then not. They're good for two weeks, then not. But Ellen White's book is amazing. Like all of a sudden, all these things you might've struggled with are gonna fall to the wayside when you understand the spiritual reason of why we shouldn't be doing those things. And next week, we're actually going to get into our digestive system. Out of all your systems, your digestive system actually takes up the most energy. And a lot of people don't think they have issues with their digestive system. They think, oh, I'm totally fine. But there's certain foods and things that we drink all the time that are actually irritating your digestive system. And they're actually benumbing your brain and your spiritual sensibilities. Ellen White wrote about this 160 years before it became popular. But if you go on YouTube right now, you can check out like gut microbiome and all types of people are studying this. So it's not just Adventists, it's actually people all over the world. And that's what we're gonna talk a little bit more about next week. So if you wanna come out to that, it's gonna be chapter four, and it's gonna be on digestive health and what we can eat, what we can drink, things that we can do so that we're maximizing our digestive process, giving it a rest, 
so that we don't experience a lot of the issues that people in the US are experiencing. So it's 6.59, I think we did it. We closed under seven o'clock. Next week, I will not be talking as much, but because it was the first week, I really wanted to crunch in a bunch of information. So before we close, does anybody want to share any last thoughts or anything that stood out to you? Um, did you want to share it with the group before we pray? Just remember that as we go through this health message, the uh, the book Councils on Diets and Food is a compilation of of a lot of good stuff, and uh, in other books, it's also it's also in Ministry of Healing and Adventist Home and all that kind of stuff. So. Councils and Diets and Foods is a good book. And if you obey, <laughs> you will do much better than just sacrificing your body and your mind. That's my share. Amen. I just wanted to give a really quick um, testimony about someone that used to attend Three Angels. She moved, I guess, somewhere in like Central Florida recently, but she had been living with someone from church. So that person was able to see her diet. And it was a really poor diet. Like she ate like a carton of eggs in like a week. And like she ate a whole bunch of cheese and it was just a really unhealthy diet. And it got to the point where she was having breathing problems. She ended up going to the hospital. They said her arteries were clogged. So they were going to put a stint, a stent in. And I guess they scheduled that procedure for a couple of days or, or a week or so out. And they ended up um, when they did the, I don't know what it's called, but when they looked to see if the stent also needed to go in, she had like cut off the the bad diet. She had reversed her, her dietary habits. Again, I don't know how long it was that between that time, it seemed like it wasn't really like a, a long, like, it, I don't think it was like several months that she had made that change, but um, they decided that they didn't need to put the stent in anymore because her artery was completely free. And she's Amen. the type of person where she likes to witness a lot. Like her car is like a walking billboard for Jesus. So I know that in that moment, she probably used that to glorify God, but it was also just a miracle that people who knew the diet that she had um, were able to look and say like, wow, like God, God was able to do this. So it's just encouragement that, you know, even though we may have abused our bodies, if we truly repent and make the changes that are um, there for us to make, that God can truly like restore our bodies to, you know, a, a good condition. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Our gut, our gut health is so important, and there's lots of studies out there that gut health affects everything, and yeah. then our <clears throat> study of the brain is second. So, you know, being healthy is going to involve a lot of changes to maintain on a regular basis. Amen. Good share. And as you guys know, we're going to be posting some health interviews. So in a few days, if you check out the church's YouTube page, um, Chris Jones, our former pastor, his wife, Chris Jones, you might not realize this, but she actually lost 25 pounds in three months just by reverting to a plant-based diet. It was something she grew up with, but kind of fell away from. And as soon as she embraced it again, 25 pounds in three months is pretty substantial. And she's kept it off for like seven years now. So I Amen. just want to let you guys know that if you want to listen to it, she's really sweet. She's easy to listen to. And she kind of gives her personal testimony of how she grew up, how she got away from it, how she went back to it, and how she's been successful for the last seven years. So that will post in a couple of days if you want to check out the church's YouTube page. Um, but you. if anyone doesn't mind closing us in prayer, we appreciate your time. And we, we thank you for making that time to be with us. Amen. You mind if I pray again? I would love it. Thank you. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we've gotten a blessing, Lord. Uh, to do all this stuff, Lord, is, is your will. Uh, so we ask, Lord, that your will be, would be done. We are weak and we are in need of your help. We need Jesus in our lives all the time. So I pray, Father in heaven, that as we go through this, we will be convicted so much that we will even do these things that you've asked us to do so that we will finally be able to be that witness to the the people around us uh, but really mostly to ourselves so that we can be well we can be proud of ourselves that we've done right uh, open our hearts and our, our eyes uh, to uh, be strengthened by your holy spirit and we thank you in jesus name amen amen, amen. amen. amen.